Hello everyone, I'm back. Did you miss me? I missed you. It's so great to see you again. Today, I'm going to do another in my continuing series, which this is only the second one, but it's going to be a continuing series uh, from book to film or TV or whatever other medium it may end up in. So today, this is a book that went to film and the book and film that I am covering is Drumroll, please. The Zone of Interest by Martin Amis. Amis. Um, uh, this guy. So he is a very popular writer and he's done a lot of books, very prolific. Uh, this is the first one I've read. This is copyright 2014. It is a very unusual novel about the Holocaust. This novel focuses on the aggressors, the Nazis, in particular, one family. The three principal characters are the matriarch Hannah Dahl, her husband Paul Dahl, who is the commandant of Auschwitz, and there is also Angelus Thompson, who is a soldier under Paul's command and happens to have the Hotspur's wife. Now, the thing is, the Dahls the husband, the wife, and their two daughters live in a house which is built directly across from the camp. It is right next to it, across from the wall. It's a cute little family home with a cute little garden, but it, it, it's right there. So yeah, interesting situation. Now, in this book, Hannah hates her husband with good reasons. Uh, because he entrapped her into the marriage. And she comes up with many ways to psychologically torture him. Uh, for his part, Paul is already shown to be coming apart at the seams, um, as probably are many soldiers that shown subtly, but they do drink too much and other things like that. Now, Angelus is one of those soldiers who he isn't shown to do much directly um, that's bad, um, but he also doesn't do anything to undermine proceedings. He just goes in and does his job. If he's undermining anybody, it's Paul. Now, there are Jewish prisoners as supporting characters, and we spend some time in the camp seeing the horrors that are there. There are many things that happen along the way of this story. One of them is a woman who is an acquaintance of the dolls, and everybody's friends with her, but then it is discovered that one of her grandparents had Romani blood. This means she is tainted and she gets put in the camp. However, Paul has a thing for her. He intervenes on her behalf. They have an affair, and uh, which culminates in her having to get an abortion. There is also um, a Jewish man named Smul. It's S-C-M-U-L. Thus far, he has managed to escape his own extermination. Um, he and his fellow workers called Saunders have managed to escape that fate by managing the extermination of so many others. So there are many different aspects in the stories kind of showing how the human brain adapts in order to survive both on the side of the victors and of the vanquished. Now, at the end of the story, Paul is, the allies have won. Um, Hannah is raising her children on her own because Paul is dead. And Angelus has managed to escape any punishment by working directly with the allies. He meets up with Hannah, but they both realize there's no future for them. They have both in their own way been collaborators in evil and that past is no basis to have a relationship. Now, this novel is based on true events. The dolls are based on uh, the Hesses or Husses. Uh, it's spelled H-O-S-S -S in German and H-E-S-S -S when it's Americanized. So I'm going to go with Hess. This is where things get even more interesting. I'm switching to the film now. The film was released in 2023, directed by Jonathan Glazer. Now, the film is loosely based on the novel, very loosely. There's the same basic premise 
of the family living in the house right next to the concentration camp, literally right over the wall. That is it. The film is in fact so different from the novel that while watching it, I seriously questioned whether it was based on the novel at all um, until I saw in the end credits, oh yes, based on the novel by this guy. So the commandant and his family live in the little house right beside Auschwitz. The dolls, however, are now directly the Hesseds. They have five children, uh, two boys and a baby, in addition to the two daughters. Thompson has been excised as a character. He has nothing to do with this story whatsoever. The attention is mainly on the Hesses and their doings. There are barely Jewish people in this story at all. However, they definitely are part of the story, and I'll explain that in a minute. A big change is in the character of Hannah. Now her name is Hedwig. She is apparently devoted to her husband and to her lifestyle and home. In fact, when her husband, now Rudolf, uh, is ordered to transfer the head of another camp, she refuses to go with him. So yes, when it comes to Jewish people, we don't see many of them in the movie at all. There are a couple of prisoners who are sent to the house to unload things. When Hedwig's mother comes to visit, she questions the girl servants in the house, and her daughter explains, oh no, they're not Jewish, they're girls from the town. All the Jews are on the other side of the wall. We do not go in to the camp whatsoever. The closest we get is we briefly join Rudolf on the train platform as the Jews are being unloaded. However, we focus only on him. We do not see anybody else. We do venture sometimes out of the house otherwise. The family has idyllic outings by the river, which is close by the house and the road adjoining. We follow Hedwig down the road past the camp at one point where she goes to meet her husband by the river. There are scenes like that. Then we do venture to another town when Rudolph is transferred. And there's a brief sequence when we see a Polish family who also lives close by the camp. Uh, again, I'll go into that more in a minute. However, here's the thing. The camp is almost always in the movie, at least when we're at the house, in one way or another. You can see it right on the other side of the wall because the buildings come up higher. There are smokestacks. We know what those are from. And it can be seen from this house and also from the house of the Polish family. Now, more than that, we can hear it because the grinding sound of the incinerators is constantly going in the background. Sound is a very heavy player in this film. There is one sequence where we're focusing on the beautiful flowers in the garden, but that is juxtaposed with the sound of shots and screams. We watch the flowers, then the picture fades into a solid color, and we're left focusing on just the sounds. There are many powerful moments like that. So even though much of the action takes place in the house, in the garden, there is never any question to the audience that this is an illusion of an idyllic home life. The shots of the rooms are contained. They contain the walls, the ceiling, it's a contained area, but the constant sound in the background shows that nothing can shut out the truth. The banality of the evil even makes its way into the family's home. Hedwig and the other ladies of the house, her close servants and companions, they get periodic deliveries of clothing and jewelry which have been taken from the murdered camp inhabitants. And they go through these and pick out what they would like. They sift through, they try on with no spark of remorse or reflection. They even sit and gossip about their acquaintances who also do the same, including a woman who took a dress far too small for her. The eldest son is part of the Hitler youth. He is shown uh, at separate intervals lying awake in bed at night, uh, going through his collection of teeth that his father has brought home for him. All the children being brought up in this way simply accept it as reality. This is what is, because they don't know any different. So these things are there to disturb us. They should disturb us. Now, there are other ways in which the film keeps us from buying in to this illusion that the family has created for themselves. 
When Hedwig's mother comes to visit at first, she is thrilled by the house and the garden and delighted at how her daughter has landed on her feet. But she is also the first character to directly allude to the camp, wondering aloud if a former acquaintance might have ended up there. Also, she ends up being put to stay in the room of the daughters, which, it turns out, faces the camp. So even though the curtains are down, at night, the light from the fire shines into the room and she can't sleep. She gets up and looks out the window at it. And we can see that that makes an impact on her. This is the first obvious dent in any character's acceptance of that illusion. Later, there is also a brief moment where the youngest son is playing alone in his room and a bit of extra noise from the outside comes to his ears and he does get up and briefly looks at the curtain. Then he stops himself and goes back and tells his toys, no, we don't look. So yes, this movie especially is about the mundanity of evil. In so many ways, the Hesses are just a family living out their lives. One daughter is prone to sleepwalking, and we show Rudolph tenderly picking her up, carrying her back to bed, and reading Hansel and Gretel to her. In another scene, he takes two of his children swimming at the river when he notices something in the water that is bad, and he rushes to rescue them, to get them out of there. He takes them home. Everybody scrubs them down so they'll be safe, and they won't get sick. What was in the water? It was human remains. There are also a couple scenes with multiple Nazis. These are very basic business meetings. There's a scene at Rudolph's house where they go over schematics for a new oven system. Then later when he is transferred, he's at a large office building. It's a very large meeting. And basically it's a business deciding what they're going to do next quarter. After one such meeting, Rudolph leaves late at night after everyone else is gone. He heads down the stairs toward his temporary living quarters. And a ways down the stairs, he is overcome by sudden nausea and wretches for a little while. This is the only point where it is shown that however unconscious, there may be a part of him that is repulsed by his actions. This is a particularly great scene because after retching, he pauses and looks down the darkened hall. At this point, there's an edit. The film switches to present day. And we see workers cleaning out the gas chambers, the museum. They're cleaning and prepping the Museum of Auschwitz, getting it ready for visitors. That shows that even today, such an area where such horrific things happen is filled with mundanity because the people who have lasted and been able to have children who have grown at the time has passed, people are still going about their lives. However, the difference here is that Hess and his like have passed from the scene. So everything that they worked for did not last. We then switch back to Hess looking down the hall as if he's seen all this coming. It's like he's looking toward the inevitability of the uselessness of it all. So, final thoughts. Again, the film is very loosely based on the book. So you read the book, then you go to the movie, don't go in expecting the same thing, or vice versa. Basically, only the essential premise is the same thing. Now, for that reason, because both stories are masterfully told in very different ways, I highly recommend watching the one, reading the other, doing both. Just give some room in between because predictably this story, that story, they're both very heavy. Each one has scenes and shots and lines that will stick with you. But then again, I, I don't think you go into any story about the Holocaust expecting a rockin' good time, or at least I would hope you wouldn't. So this isn't really a content warning, just an underlining that, yes, those expectations of a story of tragedy, degradation, and 
humans' capability of cruelty to other humans, those expectations will be met. You know, humans are capable of so much. Just unlimited kindness and generosity, but also the lowest depths of malice and brutality. And we must always be on our guard to be sure that the latter does not win out. So yes, very heavy subject matter today. Um, hopefully next time I'll come up with something lighter, but it, it's worth it. The book is worth it. The movie is worth it. Definitely check them both out. And uh, yes, I'll see you next week when we will have happy fun times and something light and fluffy. I don't know what yet, but I, I will definitely switch gears then. Uh, we all need it. Um, so yes, I'll see you next week. I hope you join me. Bye.